uh, why we still think that is because many of the important figures of social transformation in Malabar have not received the attention that they deserve. So I am hoping that Divya's, through Divya's lecture, we will be able to uh, make, uh, make good, uh, you know, at least make amends. Uh, and so welcome all of you to the fourth Akam lecture. Divya Kanan, of course, needs no um, introduction to um, CDS, to all of us at CDS. Uh, she is a scholar in history and has done considerably important work uh, about the life and times of Swakmana Ananda. Uh -huh. And she is the best person to introduce this figure to us. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Divya. It's over to you now. Thank you, Dr. Devika, and to everyone at CDS for this opportunity to, in fact, revisit my work, which I actually did during my MPhil. Uh, so I must, as precautionary veil, mention that it's been a while since I have had the opportunity to return to this topic of Vagbadananda. But at the same time, I'm also very happy to see a renewed interest in lesser known figures, as Dr. Devika already pointed out, um, in the history of uh, Kerala's uh, Renaissance. And the reason why I stress on the word renewed is because now Vagbrananda is a far more popular figure through writings, uh, and in fact, even a short movie that was made on his life. And um, no program or edited volume on Kerala Renaissance is now complete without any mention of Vagbrananda Gurudeva. Today, uh, I'm hoping that I will say some things new that uh, the audience at CDS is not aware of, but also to provoke you to rethink the role of religion in understanding anti-caste dissent. Because in contemporary debates, uh, anybody who is interested in anti-caste dissent, we, there is a commonsensical notion, which I find problematic, that anybody who is anti-caste must also necessarily be immediately anti-religion. And what we find in Vagbhadananda's expositions is that is not the case. He is able to make a distinction between religion and caste. And in fact, um, as my talk will show that he is interested in what he calls civilizing religion towards social and political purposes. So what his fundamental aim was to be anti-clerical, to uh, put forward a humanistic project to usher in a kind of modernity for the subaltern caste. And at the same time, he was very aware of the importance, symbolic and social importance that believers placed in the organization called religion. So starting from that point, uh, I would be discussing Vagbaranda Gurudeva. And I also want to uh, talk a bit about the multiple pathways to modernity. Because in the 19th century, as well as the early 20th century, both in colonial Kerala, in you know, parts of uh, India, what we witness are similar movements among subaltern groups, be it Swami Achyutanand in colonial you know, Uttar Pradesh or uh, in Maharashtra. What we are uh, discovering is that scholar thinkers, as well as spiritual figures, are all trying to conceptualize the refashioning of the self and by extension, a refashioning of the communities uh, from which they uh, hail from. So what we have to place the history of Vagbadananda and his contemporaries also in the story of modernity in Kerala. I, um, As a historian, I do find the use of the term Renaissance very limiting for understanding indigenous social philosophy. One um, is that one strand of thinking will immediately tell you that it seems like an import from European historical categories. Um, but even if we were to keep aside the elements of European uh, thinking, uh, Renaissance really does not capture the distinctiveness of anti-caste reform movement in a place like uh, colonial Kerala. And that is precisely because caste is um, unfortunately unique to the Indian subcontinent. Uh, and therefore, to compare the Kerala Renaissance with a kind of a European Renaissance, in my opinion, um, seems a bit anachronistic at some stages. But I understand the potent that the word has for popular discourses. When we say Renaissance, it does bring to our mind uh, ideas of social renewal, ideas of protest and dissent. And it is within that larger intellectual history that today I'm going to uh, discuss Vagbhadananda Gurudeva. 
Now, Vagbadananda was not Vagbadananda when he was born. He was uh, known as Vaileri Kunikannan Gurukal, um, you know, born in Talasheri. And uh, he belonged to a small section of the Priya community who were well versed in matters of Sanskrit logic and grammar. And you can imagine that gives him an advantage over the rest of his uh, community who at this stage uh, in the 1880s are still steeped in uh, illiteracy. Punikaran Gurukal, the Gurukal title is something that is bestowed upon him for being a precocious young person who uh, displays the you know, exemplary abilities to teach Sanskrit and other subjects of his time. And VK Gurukal decides to undertake long journeys across Malabar at this time. Now, please remember Malabar in the 1880s and 1890s is a dynamic space as opposed to what we know from our uh, traditional histories. It is not an unchanging region. It is a region, uh, as Dr. Devika already mentioned, that is undergoing a violent direct administration by the British. Um, you know, oppressive land tenures in which Jennies have taken over large amounts of land. But at the same time, you also have the arrival of new characters into the milieu of Malabar, such as the European Christian missionaries. And one group that was very active in Malabar during the 1880s and 1890s was the Basel Mission Group. Um, we are already familiar with Herman Gundert, who is almost seen as an honorary Malayali citizen. But Herman Gundert belonged to the Basel German Missionary Society, coming from a small mercantile city called Basel in Switzerland, uh, where the missionaries actually came from southwestern Germany, belonging to peasant families. The reason why I mentioned uh, the rural origins of the Basel mission is because this deeply influenced the way the missionary workers behaved uh, with various communities in Malabar. And they were most close with the members of the Tia community at this time. I am not sure, we do not have any hint from Vagbrana that he was uh, friendly with the missionaries or he already knew them. Uh, but what we do know is that the Basel mission had a number of schools at this time. They had already translated uh, several texts. The Anglo-Malayalam dictionaries had already been published. And therefore, I can, I think, safely speculate that Vagbrananda was well aware of the polemical debates of the Christian missionaries with Orthodox Hindu scholars uh, at this time. Um, I would encourage you to hold on to that thought because it is the Christian missionary who is uh, articulating or providing a new language for the subaltern caste in colonial Kerala at that time about ideas of self and self-improvement. This is not to say it's an idea that is unique to them, but they are provoking new discourses of uh, rights, early discourses on rights, civil rights, social and political spaces of citizenship by the late 19th century through their activities among the subaltern groups. The, other question uh, in Malabar is also the rule of the British, who on paper declared that everybody is equal before law. But we know in practice that the British were not very keen to interfere in matters of uh, religion and society. They had a so-called policy of non-interference, uh, which we uh, many historians have read as deeply problematic. Uh, and although they claimed non-interference, it allowed the subaltern caste claim uh, rights as subjects from the state. We see that they are not very successful in the immediate decades, but this discourse of the state uh, as uh, a welfare state or the state being held accountable for the welfare of the subjects, uh, the genesis of it is also coming from the late 19th century onwards. So Vagbhadananda is born into such a milieu in Malabar where the Christian missionaries have raised uh, a severe attack on Hindu orthodoxy. They have called out uh, on the regressive rituals uh, of many upper caste families and written copiously about the sufferings of the lower caste, particularly uh, the Dalits and what is today known as the OBC. Bhagbrananda, after his initial studies with his father, Koran Gurukul, um, moves to the town of Kolikod or Calicut which uh, even today is you know, a hub of cultural conversations. And there he meets members of the Brahma Samaj, which has a very faint uh, existence in Malabar at this time. Um, and uh, he's able to befriend people of the Brahma Samaj. 
and through them he meets uh, another reformer whom i think not much has been worked upon in kerala but we already know something brahmananda shivayogi shivayogi uh, whose original name was karat govind menon starting to espouse uh, anti clericalism he is writing against uh, idol worship he is condemning the elaborate rituals of not just the upper caste but as well as of other castes and vagdanda as a young man uh, joins shivayogi in his journeys and his speeches uh, and takes on the mantle of being the representative of the philosophy of raja yoga in fact the title vagbadananda is given to him by shivayogi Uh, and it happened uh, on a, and it is said that it happened at a public ceremony where vagbadananda rose to the occasion to defend his uh, mentor and in appreciation of his uh, oratorical skills uh, gurukul vk gurukul is given the title vagbadananda or the defender of of speech or the goddess of speech and that is how he gets this uh, popular name now with shivayogi we have to credit shivayogi for the fact that he is able to encourage uh, vagbadananda to think very closely about the futility of idol worship uh, although he is not an advaitin himself shivayogi is pressing upon vagbadananda the idea of the self um, and through the self he talks about transcendental meditation he is interested in de-emphasizing these distinctions of class and caste and vagbadananda is building upon it uh, throughout the early decades of the 1900s but somewhere in 1914 he finds uh, shivayogi's espousal or extreme stress on the mind problematic and vagbadananda in fact uh, parts ways with his uh, mentor you know perhaps uh, rather acrimoniously uh, and he leaves uh, shivayogi to start his own organization which we now know as the atma vidya sangam Uh, the reason why i am giving you this background is it's allow us allows us to trace the evolution of vagbadananda uh, as a thinker and the kind of influences uh, that he has um, at this time what is vagbadananda doing if on one hand you don't like i mentioned before you don't think of it as completely unique and yet at the same time you have a figure who is going to now be overshadowed by shri nayana guru and sndp which is perhaps one of the reasons why we know of sndp as a representative um, of the eravas and tiyas and not much about the atma vidya sangam but vagbadananda is able to carve out a space of his own in malabar uh, in early 20th century and the biggest contribution that he does is that he is advancing the language of modernity through humanistic thought and he constantly talks about the self or the atman or the realization or self knowledge as the foundation of a new religion so on one hand uh, it is the value of universalism that he espouses that you know irrespective of your religion and caste you could be part of this new religion or new organization called atma vidya sangam uh, and at the same time he has a very pointed critique of orthodox uh, hinduism and sanatan dharma and one of the ways in which he is able to articulate his project of modernity is to attack priesthood this is something that is is lifelong project where he thinks it's not just the priests of the upper caste but also the priests of the shrine culture that the tiyas were following what we know as the kav uh, the kavu culture he's even critiquing that according to him he finds it barbaric he finds it problematic he thinks it um, is the hub of all kinds of uh, immoralities but more than that he's attacking social power of those who claim to be priests because according to vagbadananda the only way to break out of this exploitative extractive feudal system was to realize that one could look towards a supreme being within one's self uh, and that self knowledge could only come about as again shivayogi is teaching him through a great practice of self discipline and self improvement self improvement and self discipline become very key terms for vagbadananda's project which we again see in shrinayana guru and many other reformers of this time but in vagbadananda's case he does not necessarily think that the project of self transformation uh, requires temple consecration or it requires certain people to claim special privileges and powers so in to such an extent that by the 1920s uh, he is already critiqued shrinayana guru in his presence um in one of the magazines published by uh, you know shivayogi 
there was an excerpt in fact some one of the last surviving excerpts uh, of the conversation between guru and vagbrandan where vagbrandan reminds guru that while i am in praise of what you are doing i think you are going to uh, you know advocate sectarianism if you continue to consecrate temple so i can imagine saying this today in today's political climate seems you know controversial of some sort but he was deeply critical of um, uh, guru extending some kind of uh, support spiritual and otherwise to the building of temples even if guru was installing uh, lamps and mirrors vagbrandan thought that this whole idea that humans are superior to this formless being that you could really uh, you know trap god in a particular room or you could claim that only some people had access to god was in a very it's a very different form of brahmanism it may not have been as exploitative but he, according to him it perpetuated similar beliefs Uh, of brahmanism and that is something that he is constantly fighting uh, during his time in malabar and through the atma vidya sangam that he starts uh, in the villages of north malabar he is able to gather uh, a group of tia agriculturalists very poor workers uh, from the villages of alikod patiam uh, nadapuram nadapuram cheruvannur and they start the sangam and indulge in a series of activities um where the aim is to one of course attack the symbolic domination of the upper caste but also to prove to the tias uh, a new alternative way of imagining freedom and independence uh, within this hierarchy so and if therefore if everybody is able to realize that the formless being is within themselves then there is no need for any kind of a hierarchy uh, and that is a powerful message at this time because he is attacking the core of the caste system and yet saying that one could civilize or, or as christopher bailey calls ethicize religion in such a way that people's moral and ethical complex can be reoriented um, again to the self and for that towards that purpose he is now starting um, you know he is also conducting inter dining events he has a few inter marriage ceremonies that he is presiding over and interestingly he god doesn't call them mishra vivaham or mishra bhojanam which we know from sahodaran ayyappan's work in fact vagbrandan's name is preeti he says preeti vivaham and preeti bhojanam so the word preeti or preet coming from happiness or affection or compassion uh, allows him to go beyond the idea that one should not alienate the upper caste in the long term but also be able to convince them to join this spiritual movement for a modern um, kerala or kerala in fact the magazine that he started itself was called abhinava kerala so there is i would say both a political and spiritual project that vagbrandananda is indulging in and he differs from chinara guru in the let's say the modality through by which he is able to go about it while chinara guru is renouncing domestic life he uh, is you know adorning the garb of a, a saint of a monk vagbrandananda is not doing that Uh, initially of course he dresses the way his guru shivayogi is doing but by the 1920s vagbranda believes that renunciation is not the way to make atma vidya a popular religion or a popular movement so he marries he adopts khadi because he is also a very very active member uh, in the anti colonial movement he is a great supporter of gandhi in fact he supported gandhi to such an extent that when gandhi came uh, to uh, travancore for the, in support of the temple entry movement vagbrandananda wrote a booklet um, critiquing the sanatan dharmas uh, with a series of questions you know exposing saying what was wrong in their argument um, and he assumed the voice of gandhi um, to critique them so you see a person who does not adopt the spiritual attire of a saint uh, in order to make his ideas popular In, but in fact in my own research i it's a speculation that i make that perhaps that was a reason that atma vidya sangam and vagbrandananda is not as popular uh, by the late 1920s unfortunately he dies uh, rather early in life by 1933 but the fact that he could not achieve the same status or the cult status as narayana guru perhaps lies in the fact that people could not um, you know move beyond or they found his ideas of you know believing in one self or indulging in self realization as you know too complicated for them in a system where priesthood was of ultimate dominance um the other problem that vagbrandananda faced throughout his life is that while he organized activities of the atma vidya sangam he did not have 
a middle class community or a group like the SNDP. So you are witnessing a man who wrote profusely, who spoke profusely, but at the level of activism did not have the finances or the organizational um, resources to do so. I'll come to that in a minute, but I think that explains the uh, decline of our understanding of Atma Vidya Sangam. And the only name that we now associate with him is the Labor Cooperative Society, ULCCS, the Uralungal Labor, uh, Labor Cooperative Society. Now, what are the religious influences of uh, Bhagavananda at this time? One of the major scriptural texts that he draws upon is the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and if you follow the work of Shruti Kapila and Faisal Devji, who have written extensively about it with other colleagues, is that the Bhagavad Gita in the 19th and 20th century is being used as a potent textual uh, weapon by many reformers and many politicians at this time. It is one text after the Quran that actually also has some kind of transnational popularity. One is uh, traced back to the period of the early 19th century when the British Orientalists are popularizing and translating Indian scriptures uh, and claiming Bhagavad Gita to be one of the texts, one of the cardinal texts of the Hindu system. But there is something about the Bhagavad Gita that they are not really able to bracket uh, like they are doing the Ramayana and other uh, mythical legends at this time. So therefore, this ambiguity or the open space flexibility that the Mahabharata uh, uh, you know, allows thinkers at this time is being used by subaltern caste reformers to critique uh, hierarchy. Uh, on one hand, we do have thinkers like Ambedkar who found it a very offensive text. Ambedkar was very anti-Bhagavad Gita. He found it as uh, legitimizing hierarchy. But interestingly, you have Vagdananda and others using Bhagavad Gita to in fact advance this idea of self-knowledge and self-realization. And he repeatedly says that nowhere in the Bhagavad Gita is there any mention of idol worship per se. That the Bhagavad Gita does not really tell us that God lives in you know, the top of Kailas or in uh, you know, Parani or by the river Ganges. And therefore, the Bhagavad Gita itself is telling that God is formless um, and you know, God is a unitary being. Then what is stopping us from actually pursuing uh, a worship of that or let's say a meditative process towards that formless being. And he says that what is stopping people are the vices of the rich, are the vices of the priestly class. So he's able to you know, produce a political economy of religion at this time to raise this critique that it is not the text in itself that is uh, advocating inequality and injustice, but it is the people who claim to be interpreting um, these texts. And in one way or the other, what Bhagavananda does, like I told you in the beginning, he is a Sanskrit scholar. He is trying to democratize religion through the democratization of scripture. So he is now encouraging members of his community and others to learn Sanskrit. Uh, and you can imagine the 20th century, this is no mean task. Because Sanskrit, even today, the very evocation of the word Sanskrit, you know, makes people think that it has a sacrosanct character. But here is a person uh, in the 1900s already starting small you know, the efforts that are unfortunately uh, failing eventually. But he's starting small set of Sanskrit schools called Tattva Prakashika in uh, Malabar. And he's encouraging members of his caste to say that if you can read Sanskrit, then you can emphasize reason over faith. And you will be able to see that no religion is infallible. And therefore, to send your children to school or to make them literate would actually mean a long-term democratization of religion itself. And in doing that, my argument is that Vagbhadananda is using technologies of the self, or like I said, self-improvement, um, you know, adorning the uh, ideas of um, a modern individual to call for a liberal public sphere. Because once religion is democratized, then people can participate together in a common public sphere. Uh, so we are moving away from a very Habermasian idea that you know you need a, a bourgeois public sphere where everybody has everybody's interests in mind and you deliberate very rationally and certain set of people can participate. From there, Vagbhananda is having a very indigenous thought of saying anybody who can read the scriptures and think for himself and herself is a member of the public sphere in Malabar at this time. And therefore, gender is no bar, caste is no bar, and definitely class is no bar. But these ideas do not go well even with members of his own community. In fact, um, at the Couture Festival in the 1920s uh, and many other small 
uh, festivals uh, and fairs in Kannur district at the time, Bhagwananda would take bands of young men singing songs of mockery, like, you know, parody uh, or satirical songs against uh, these festivals. He would also go to the Kava, uh, ka, you know, festivals of local Pia elites and he would critique uh, the worship of uh, idol, uh, idols. He would critique the figure of the Velichapad, whom he thought was nobody but a drunkard. He repeatedly wrote that the Velichapad was somebody who had to be driven away from the village for uh, being the manifestation of everything that was problematic. But Bhagavad does not receive the kind of support that Sri Rana Guru does. In fact, the Tiyas are not very pleased with Bhagavad because they find him a bit too radical. They find him too radical for saying no to idol worship completely. Uh, they're also finding him uh, radical because he's making these polemics in public debates or uh, not just taking on the Brahmin scholars of the time, but also taking on Tiyas from the community saying that you cannot claim to be the priest for everybody. That is no, there will be no priesthood. Everybody would have the right uh, and the rational ability to think for themselves. And therefore, we are looking at a new spiritual movement where Hinduism takes on a form of a democratic character, where everybody believes in certain universal values and friendship and empathy would be the foundation of the religion uh, and not rivalry um, and jealousy. And what this will do is that in your pursuit of your material pressure, you will think twice before you are able to do that because you will realize that both pleasure uh, and desire lie within yourself and you must work towards removing those sources of desire. And this, of course, resounds, uh, echoes with Buddhist thought as well. The Buddhist uh, centuries before Vagbrahanda are also making similar um, arguments about how all suffering lies uh, in matters of desire and desire lies within the body. Here is Vagbhadananda saying more than suffering that you must look at yourself uh, as a way of committing duty to society. So it's not just enough to say that I have self-knowledge, that I realize that the supreme being is within myself, but I should be able to use that realization and that uh, you know articulation of that idea of self-power for the larger good of the community. So there is no distinction at one level for Vagbhadananda between just the self and the community. Uh, unlike Sri Nana Guru, who really is not an activist on the ground, Sri Nana Guru is the spiritual mentor of the SNDP. He is writing uh, profusely, composing verses. He is like a philosophy guide for all the um, uh, Irava groups who are heading the committee. But Vagbhadananda is the teacher, preacher, and the activist for Atma Vidya Sangha. He says, I cannot meditate. I cannot wear the clothes of a monk and sit in a room and meditate because I need to now share the knowledge of the self uh, with people, both in my community and others. And this, of course, leads to other tensions because when the Tiya start setting up temples, uh, much to his displeasure, many of them are not allow allowing the Dalits uh, and the Arya fishing community to enter the temple. So in one way, Vagbranda is vindicated uh, in what he tells Guru, that this could lead to sectarianism. And we see that in 1920s, 30s, uh, we see that in the work of Dilip Menon as well, where there are feelings of sectarianism among the Tiyas who are not particularly interested in critiquing their own practices of distance pollution with the Dalits. And Vagbranda, one could say, uh, was a visionary in having foreseen this problem of temple consecration by the Eravas um, at this time where he says that if we continue to do this, if we continue to one, not share self-knowledge, but on the other hand, use the self-knowledge to only build temples and schools and exclude the Dalits, then we are not going to uh, you know, go very far in terms of what we think um, is a new kind of uh, Kerala. The other scripture that he is, of course, you know, looking at are the Upanishads. And the reason why I'm mentioning Upanishads and Gita uh, at this time is the Gita allows uh, Bhagavananda also to uh, not articulate the praise of Krishna, but to say that people are not perfect. And so he is not really pressurizing his followers towards a, a pursuit of complete perfection, that we are all beyond mistake. In fact, he, his idea is to say that we are full of mistakes and we must learn from our mistakes, but we should be able to do it with a, what he calls a healthy and clean mind. And what we need to fight is the barbarity um, that we are capable of. And at the time of the First World War, 
when uh, the news of the carnage of the world war reaches Vagbhananda, he is deeply sad and he writes extensively in the Madhrabhumi uh, as an example of how what the limits of self-knowledge are if we do not fight uh, or cleanse ourselves of the barbarity that we are bringing about. In terms of the activities that Bhagbhananda is doing, I mentioned ULCCS. The, just a brief history of the ULCCS is when Bhagbhananda was involved in this Preeti Vivaham and Preeti Bhojanam events, uh, and he was talking about anti-temples, the tiyas of his community uh, face boycott from uh, the landlords, from the Nair landlords of the time in districts of Karnur. And many of them are facing um, you know, problems of starvation and disease. And they come to Bhagbhananda saying, you know, Atma Vidya and all is fine, but there's only so much we can do in, in the face of, uh, you know, loss of livelihood. It is at that point that Bhagbhananda is suggesting to them that we must start a credit cooperative society. So first he starts the Aikya Nanaya Sangha, which is a United Credit Society. Uh, and eventually it is registered by uh, a, a, group, a dozen members uh, as the Ura Lungal um, Labor uh, Society, which later is again re-registered as today's um, ULCCS. And the ULCCS is a testimony uh, to Vagdananda's pragmatism, right? So he realizes that, you know, he cannot, you know, stretch his argument of Atma Vidya at a time where the Tiyas who are supporting him come from very, very poor section. Uh, and uh, what the ULCCS does is they are able to raise funds to start work and participate in the British government's, colonial British government's PWD works um, at this time. So we see that the colonial government still becomes a source of new forms of mobility and capital for the believers um, of Atma Vidya Sangha. And they are able to uh, fight this kind of repression of the landlords uh, and you know, throwing them out of the land by becoming wage laborers uh, in the Madras and Malabar uh, you know, public work. My argument also is that I don't think, many, in fact, unfortunately, many popular histories of the ULCCS uh, they say that Vagbhananda, you know, founded ULCCS and he started it. Well, definitely the idea came from Vagbhananda. There is no denial that he gave the idea, but the idea was already popular in the Madras presidency at this time. So by 1912, you have the Madras Cooperative Society Acts, uh, and the British are in fact encouraging and giving small grants to organizations who want to undertake uh, cooperative work. Uh, so what we see is Vagbhananda being very Seen, uh, on the ground watching what the government is doing in the presidency of Madras in other districts and he's able to borrow some of those ideas uh, for his members in uh, North Malabar. Just to look at briefly uh, in towards the end on how does the SNDP view Vagbhadanandan at this time. He's of course not seen as a threat. In fact, Guru uh, is extremely pleased with Vagbhadanandan during their meeting. It is said that uh, perhaps Vagbhadanandan was able to coerce uh, or let's say compel Guru to rethink his position on temples. One cannot really validate this argument, but the, that's what believers of Vagbhananda's philosophy say, that when they met, that Guru is believed to have said that I am not really interested in setting up temples, but I am being forced by my members to do so. Uh, and I have surrendered to their pressure to establish the temple. So we do see uh, a few years before Vagbhananda passes away, uh, where Guru and Vagbhananda are converging on this idea that what the community needs is education and occupation, uh, more than a revival of uh, temple building and institution. At the same time, what you all, what we also see is that Vagbhananda's espousal of Advaita uh, is not going down well in the long term. In fact, this whole idea of world-denying philosophy, where the material world uh, is Maya, um, Again, my argument is that it perhaps does not hold a radical potential in the long run for members of subaltern castes who genuinely believe that their indigenous knowledge also has some value, that their labor also has value, their material reality uh, is of essence uh, to them uh, and to their uh, descendants. So therefore, in pushing this, what Bhagbhananda thinks is a pure form of Advaita, he's constantly saying one must have a very pure idea of uh, Advaita. Um, my speculation is that that message really is not acceptable to many members uh, of the community. Whereas the SNP is able to appropriate more popular modes of worship. They are able, of course, one to raise funds. They do have uh, more sources of revenue. They do have um, you know, greater support and visibility in Travancore um, because of their negotiations with the state. Um, but their appropriation of popular modes 
of uh, ritual and belief is overshadowing the atma vidya sangam's effort in fact vagbananda does travel to travancore a few times to talk about atma vidya sangam but it does not really meet um, the kind of uh, support that he uh, expects now what why are we interested in vagbananda what does it tell us uh, in fact i had an opportunity to look at the previous talks uh, in the series uh, and you had talks on chatambi swamigal on you know uh, on amakti tangal on halima bibi and what we see is that thinkers across the spectrum are all invested in the question of a malayali modernity i, I don't say kerala because this is at this time there is no conception of kerala as such but there is this malayali modernity um, that all the thinkers are sharing and each of them are approaching this through their own ways but holding on to religion um, as a site of reform so even in their basic conceptualization religion is not a rigid formulation uh, you know which which is not the case in how we today look at religion as you know opium of the masses and people are all blind about it but they are able to say that religion in itself carries certain radical potential if we are able to put across to people that it is rationality that must guide our notions of religion um, and not vice versa so in putting across a project of rationality and humanism modernity is being rethought um, in kerala where there will be no caste but people could still unite organizationally uh, towards a larger pursuit of of the common good right so there is the particular playing uh, in conversation Uh, and not simply you know in opposition with uh, the universal you also have scholars like uday kumar who has worked on sndp extensively who talks about why the body itself is being reformed but vagbananda goes a step further he is able to say that it is simply again not your body so it's not really enough to say i am aware of my bodily movements and my bodily desires um it is truly within the self i mean it's very difficult to translate into english but something like the mind or the soul Uh, is going to be the driving force, and therefore it doesn't really matter what form your body takes, as long as you claim independence from uh, upper caste uh, violence and orthodoxy. Which is why uh, Vagbananda is able to wear khadi, is able to marry, he has children, and he's able to say that just because I am, uh, you know, partaking of these domestic pleasures and domestic life, it doesn't take me away from the pursuit um, of the self. It doesn't make me any less a human being. or any less free than others who claim to be uh, spiritually uh, superior um, and you know almost like a priest so he is able to have a project of humanism speak to a project of modernity um, and ask people to rethink what religion exactly is and to me uh, as a scholar of uh, you know 1920th century kerala there is great potential in looking at religion like this Uh, at a time when religion is not just divisive not just in terms of communalism uh, but also our identities are so tied in with who we are in terms of our ritual practices vagbananda is a good antidote to remind us about the excesses of that kind of a religious belief right so we and he in fact will if he was alive he would mock us for our hypocrisy uh, you know for all our beliefs or all our condemnation of others for being religious uh, and yet deep down holding on to our own small superstitions um, and you know irrational beliefs when it comes to our own lives so for for me what I, what this allows us in the context of recent debates in religion particularly the debates on shabrimala entry uh, question of women entering um, or the question of you know religious godmen um, as well as uh, you know people moving into other revivalist uh, movements especially by young people across religions it allows us to stop and think of what are the ways in which one could articulate a new language of dissent uh, whether we call it popular dissent or a more a kind of a you know, fundamental dissent using the same set of tools that you don't really need to alienate people from the question of religion but in fact think within their own world uh, and you know show to them that what are the follies what are the problems uh, in pursuing this a materialistic form of religion which takes them away from the idea of the self So I'm going to uh, stop here now, and I'm looking forward to an interesting conversation. Thank you so much, Divya. I mean, I the the reception here is horrible, and that's why I'm not switching the um, the video on. I was able to uh, listen to the last part parts of your lecture, and thank God, last fifteen twenty minutes, I was able to 
actually catch much of what you were saying. So, uh, but still, please forgive me uh, if my question is um, kind of off the mark or if you already addressed it in the beginning of the talk. Uh, now we have time for questions. Um, by way of just starting off the discussion, I just want to ask Divya one question uh, based on uh, remarks made in the latter half of the talk. So, you know, when I was listening to that part, I was, I mean, it, it is a fascinating um, uh, inquiry. Thank you very much for doing this. And um, my question is about civil society, you know, the whole idea of civil society. Now we know that theoretically, uh, the whole idea of civil society as it has been posed, uh, it has been posed in, you know, uh, what should I say, in um, post uh, in very, very different ways. When mm -hmm. we have Marx, who talked about civil society, the whole Marxian tradition which associates civil society with religion and um, you know, conservative institutions. We have another tradition of theorizing civil society which looks at uh, it as a potential source of social change and <coughs> so on. And now, how would you, um, how would you uh, place uh, Bhagavadananda's thinking in our traditions of thinking civil society? Because from your talk, what I felt was he seems to be perhaps one of uh, the most important contributors to a uh, conception of civil society in in uh, in the Malayal among the Malayalam speaking people, which could be a potentially a source of social change and uh, development as well. Because in the 1990s and 1980s and 90s, we started looking at civil society as a source of, um, you know, um, energy for setting up uh, un understanding development in a different way. So in both ways, uh, he seems to be far ahead of his times. But again, we have the debate around civil society and religion. Again, we seem to be uh, seeing an effort to build, a, to craft literally a civil society without rejecting religion. Uh, I would really love to know what you think about uh, these questions. But maybe we can collect a few questions before we start the discussion. Well, uh, does anybody else want to ask a question? Please raise your hands and just ask because I'm not in a, I mean, I may completely miss uh, uh, your voice because my audio reception is really very poor. Uh, am I audible to you? Yes, yes, you are. Are there any other Am questions? I audible? Yes, you are. I can, I can hear you. You are audible, ma'am. Yes, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, so let me just, uh, you know, engage with what Dr. Devika was asking. So, you know, I did briefly mention that it's my speculation that Vagbrananda is also trying to uh, conceptualize, um, you know, a kind of public sphere. Um, I know we are using terms that come much, much later, but for the Atma Vidya Sangam, he is espousing associational politics for sure. He is talking about the need for various groups um, you know, various identity groups to come together and to participate uh, in questions of seva. Uh, although he doesn't use the word seva, he says one must, um, you know, commit to the society, you know, without expecting any reward in return. But for him, that is nishkarma karma. That is the idea with which he is talking about associational politics. Uh, and you are right that without rejecting religion, uh, Bhagavananda is one of those thinkers who is able to conceptualize on what is the civil society. But at the same time, um, you know, as you're already familiar with Manali Desai's work, he is using this concept of uh, association and working for the people to uh, make claims for social and political spaces of future citizenship. So, for instance, the right to enter temples, he was very, very active in the temple entry uh, movement. He's constantly speaking about it. Uh, he's taking time out to support Gandhi uh, at the time and participate in Congress meetings. So he's able to balance his, on one hand, the pursuit of, you know, spiritual discourses and, you know, polemics uh, on one hand, but on the other hand, to also say that it is not really 
you know, distinct from the realm of politics. That we can ask for our right to enter roads and schools and institutions, uh, while at the same time rethinking uh, the uses of uh, religion. So you're absolutely right in saying that uh, Bagranda's language, uh, and because of his oratorical skills, I think if somebody worked on, uh, you know, the power of popular oratory, here is a person who is, in fact, speaking more than he is writing. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the recordings left, but one can imagine in villages and in towns, he is able to tell, convince people through examples um, on what would it mean to create that kind of a society where what binds everybody together is this idea of self-knowledge uh, and religion. And then using that as a constructive power to engage in questions of civil society, particularly rights. He's very much interested in the question of rights uh, for the subaltern caste. And especially his focus is on the right to access scriptures. And he's uh, constantly emphasizing that, you know, the right to learn Sanskrit is something that they will have to wrest from the upper caste. They will have to, you know, go and take it from the upper caste. Uh, and once we can speak and read and write in Sanskrit, uh, then this whole rhetoric of being sacred and sacrosanct will fall. And with the falling of that idea of Sanskrit's uh, sacro, you know, sacrosanct character, then religion will be opened up for uh, new ideas. Uh, so, for instance, I could even, um, you know, show that in his right, for instance, there is something that he um, writes, and this is just a quote from one of his writings, where he uh, is also debunking this idea of idol worship. And he says, Shiva is a mortal being who married Parvati, bore children, and later died. It is foolishness to believe that he is immortal. It is better to believe in the supreme being who is eternal and formless and go ahead and lead a good life. God need not assume any other form to bless his devotees, and he will never assume the form of any idol. In my opinion, the rituals and customs surrounding these gods are only inappropriate and futile. And he repeatedly says this to invert the idea of caste. And because Dr. Devika asked me about civil society, I also want to point out uh, that uh, he's also talking about the question of merit. I mean, merit, I'm loosely translating, uh, you know, uh, this Malayalam words uh, into merit, but he has an inversion. His theory of inversion is that anybody can be a Shudra, anybody can be a Brahmin in society, depending on their qualities and behavior and their actions. Uh, and therefore, he says that if you are somebody who's indulging in petty behavior, in violent near behavior, um, you can be a Shudra. You will be considered Shudra, not because Shudra is untouchable, but Shudra is somebody low uh, in the uh, Varna Shundra. And if you are intelligent and you are using your intelligence and compassion for greater good, you could, you know, you, you are a Brahmin. Now, I do, I do, you know, think about it in my work as perhaps, you know, it could it could seem problematic. It is slightly problematic because then it is still a hierarchy, right? It is still a hierarchy of thought. But for Vagdanda, it was an inversion of the idea of, um, you know, ascribed status by birth. So he said, your birth really does not matter whether you are Brahmin or Shudra, your actions do matter. And all of this is then um, brought together in rethinking questions of uh, civil society and development. And like I mentioned, the Uralungal Society, the Atma Vidya School, uh, you know, the printing of several magazines, the starting of many libraries in uh, Patiam and Ali Code are all part of this associational politics uh, related to uh, the creation of an uh, independent civil society. Thank you very much for that very detailed response. Yeah, I am. I, I now, now you know some things fall into place because no wonder he was so fascinated by Gandhi. You know, because Gandhi himself was such a great proponent of civil society, and uh, in fact, some of Gandhi's great critics, like Roy, you know, like M. N. Roy, I think the only thing that bound them was the uh, commitment to civil society as the uh, what should I say, the matrix of change rather than politics. So, yeah, I see that. Thank you very much for that detailed response. So let's see okay. if anybody else has a question. I can see Dr. Uh, has does a anyone question. else have a question? Can you raise your hands? Yes. Uh, Mridul has raised her hand. Uh, Gilbert next. So first Mridul, then Gilbert.
Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, yes. Yes, uh, so uh, Murdun, can you please uh, ask your question? I'm wondering if I'm, she's hearing me or not. Uh, 